Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. Lord God Almighty, you are our commander-in-chief, mighty warrior. Lead us into battle against the enemy, Lord. For we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions. Father, help us to keep our eyes on you, to be strong in you and in the power of your might. Father, I pray that you open hearts to receive your word on this morning. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 We are continuing in our study of the book of Joshua. Ready for battle. Today we will look at Joshua chapter 5. And I titled this message... There is purpose in the process. Come on, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We can have benediction and go home. No. <laughs> no. Okay, so next slide, please. Introduction. Um, Israel has concluded a 40-year journey from Egypt to Canaan. They've crossed the Jordan River and are preparing to take possession of the promised land. However, before they proceed into battle, the people are reminded that God is still in charge. Yes, he is. Israel is living under the Mosaic Covenant, and God is fulfilling his promise to give them the land. And so some of the things we're going to look at today, uh, we'll give some explanation in detail, but just keep in mind that these were people who were living under the Mosaic Covenant. The people had covenant obligations, right? They had covenant obligations that were given to them at Mount Sinai. For those who may not, uh, who may have uh, missed Sunday school, um, <laughs> The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Um, God delivered them from that slavery. And then after he delivered them from the slavery, he brought them to Mount Sinai. And it was at Mount Sinai that God revealed himself to the entire nation and he gave them a covenant. Right. And that covenant was simply an agreement. Um, it was the terms that defined their relationship. Right. And it was it was the boundaries and the guidelines of their relationship with God. And there were certain obligations that came with being under that covenant. However, these covenant obligations had been neglected. Some of them had been neglected during this 40 year journey in the wilderness. And we'll unpack that and, and touch on that. And so what we're going to see in this chapter um, it's kind of like a transition time, and it's a time for them to refocus and realign with God's mission. And so the question for us to ponder this morning is, what process is God using in your life to help you refocus and realign with his mission? Come on now. Mm. Next slide. Come on. Section one, how is your reputation with the enemy? <laughs> Call your attention to Joshua chapter five, verse one. And it reads, so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. See, we already heard from the, uh, when the spies talked to Rahab that the people had already heard about what God did in Egypt. Right? They were already aware of this God that had delivered these people and destroyed the Egyptian army. Then they hear about the Jordan River crossing. 
And I imagine that millions of people wandering into a land and, and crossing a river that's parted didn't go unnoticed. That there were people probably watching. All right. Mm. What's going on with these people, right? The mighty acts of the Lord struck fear in the hearts of the Canaanites. And see, what God was doing was he was preparing the way for his people to possess the land. See, he already had struck fear in them. He already, psychologically, they were already defeated in their minds. See, in those days, the people, they attributed victories to their gods, right? So if one nation conquered another nation, they would say, my God was stronger than your God. And so what God did was he said, I'm going to make my name known in all the earth. I'm going to show y'all who the strongest God is. I'm going to show y'all who the only God is. And he defeated all the gods of Egypt, which at that time was like the world's superpower. So what chance did the Canaanites have? So he, he prepared the way for his people to possess the land. Sadly, sadly, the majority of the Canaanites did not respond with repentance. Spoiler alert. Some of them do. Spoiler alert, right? But majority of the Canaanites did not respond with repentance. Regardless of seeing all the Egyptian army was obliterated. The Jordan River is parted and millions of people cross it. And you still won't repent. And that's a sign that miracles in themselves won't necessarily cause a person to believe. Amen. Talk to people say, well, if God show up and talk to me or if God do this or if God do that, then I'll believe. No, you won't. <laughs> if you don't believe now, People harden their hearts. So miracles don't necessarily mean that people are going to respond with repentance. The majority of them did. So what does that have to do with us today? We have a mission from God, right? We're not, Jesus didn't send the church out to physically take over other countries. All right, so let's clear that up, right? <laughs> You can't file, show me a scripture or verse in the Bible where Jesus said, go take over another country and force them. No, that's, that's not there. But we do have spiritual enemies, right? He did tell us to go and make disciples of all nations, right? Making disciples who live and love like Jesus. That don't sound like going into invading the land at gunpoint. That's not how you make a disciple who lives and loves like Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So we all, we're all on the same page there. So you can't use the book of Joshua and justify going and colonizing and taking over other countries and saying, well, you know, we're making them Christians. That's not how you make disciples. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right. However, spiritual enemies, the demons, right? We were not against flesh and blood. That's a new, we're in the New Testament, right? We're not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Testament. We war not against flesh and blood. See, spiritual enemies view Holy Spirit empowered believers as a threat. Okay, let's flip over to the book of Acts real quick. Acts chapter 19. As the disciples received the power of the Holy Spirit, they didn't rise up and form an army and go out and take over the Roman Empire. They did was they went out and began to do life on life with people and share the gospel with people. Yes. And God began to confirm his word. Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 11, says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. All right. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Amen. How is your reputation with the enemy? Don't go trying to fight no devils outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we see that when we go under the power of the Lord and we do things God way, Paul went and did life on life with these people. He began to win souls to Christ. God began to confirm the gospel through him. And we saw people got delivered from demonic powers and turned away from their pagan and their witchcraft because of the power of God delivering and setting people free. Let's make sure that we're walking with the Lord and in the power of his might so that we don't have to be terrified of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Next slide. Uh, section two, the process of circumcision. I call your attention back to Joshua. Chapter five, verses two through nine. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons, whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. So first, I want to start off by saying that physical circumcision is a sign of the covenant between God and the descendants of Abraham. We see that in Genesis 17, which, by the way, is right after Genesis 16, where we have the Ishmael incident. And so um, in Genesis chapter 17, God reaffirms his covenant with Abraham um, after Abraham tries to uh, bring things to pass out of his own strength by using a, a surrogate um, wife uh, to give birth to a son, um, which was not God's plan. However, uh, God reaffirms his covenant with him and implements the sign of circumcision um, as a reminder um, of uh, the promises that God has made and the covenant that he has that he will give him descendants. And so... Physical circumcision is not a means of salvation. It was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants. Um, Colossians chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 8. 
It says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so circumcision um, for us is that circumcision that we receive when we believe on Christ. The putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. Not a physical action. Circumcision of the heart is a transforming work of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart. We see that in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse 25. He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from man, but from God. In fact, circumcision of the heart is even mentioned in Deuteronomy Chapter 30, where Moses is giving his farewell address. He's letting the people know that they need a heart change. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So we see that this is a work upon the heart that God does. And Ezekiel gives a, a good explanation when he talks about the removal of the stony heart. Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. The circumcision of the heart is the transforming work of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart. We need a heart change, yes. not physical, outward, religious Amen. activities. You can look holy, All right. Be wicked. quote unquote. <laughs> like you say, Jesus said, like a whitewashed tomb. Clean on the outside, nasty on the inside. All right. <laughs> All right. Back to Joshua. Um, so God has Joshua. The people pause. They've crossed the Jordan. He says, circumcise the people. They hadn't been circumcised. This new generation hadn't. And so what we kind of see from that is that the next generation needed to submit to God's process. The disobedience of the previous generation created neglect for observance of God's expectations. We're going to get to that, what the previous generation did. But, so, we can take a, um, a warning from this, right? We can learn from this. We must be careful to discern 
What is man-made traditions? And what is God-expected ordinances, right? For example, Jesus is the only way of salvation. Amen. You must be born of the Spirit. Water baptism is an expectation for disciples when practical. And what is the point of this? God does not change. Right? So we don't want to throw out the basics of the faith for the sake of relevance. The gospel does not change and should never be compromised. In other words, the word of God does not adjust according to the trends of the culture. So that new generation, they had to get in line. They listen, you know. The Israelites wandered for 40 years due to disobedience. We're going to look at that. Numbers chapter 14. Verse 26. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? Right? They sent, they, they get, they turned a 10 day journey into 40 years. They made it to the promised land way back in numbers. <laughs> and they wouldn't go in. Because you has, uh, to, they sent in 12 spies to look, look at the land. Ten of them came back, made the people scared and doubt. And God said, okay. Okay. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints with which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years. And bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your, bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. The failure of the previous generation did not stop God's mission. What does that have to do with us? Choose to be faithful even if the majority goes astray. And um, just by way of reminder, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. The Bible is not up for vote. No amendments will be added to the scripture. Doesn't matter who you put in office. Section three, the process of Passover. <laughs> Joshua chapter five, verses 10 through 12. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. The children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So here's another uh, covenant obligation that they had to observe. Passover is a continual annual observance to memorialize the deliverance 
from Egypt. We see that in Exodus chapter 12. The final plague that the Lord brought upon the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn males in one night. The Passover sacrifice protected Israel from the death of their firstborn. The exact date of the Passover is the 15th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, the month of Bib, and the 430th year of the Hebrew sojourn in Egypt. You find out in Exodus chapter 12 the exact date that this happened, right? This is historical events. So what was the Passover? A lamb is selected on the 10th day of the first month. One lamb per household. The lamb must be without blemish. One year old. It could be a sheep or a goat. Then the lamb is kept for four days. It's kept until the 14th day of the first month. The lamb is killed at the beginning of the Hebrew 24-hour cycle at twilight. Right? There was evening and morning of another day. See that? Genesis 1-5. The blood of the lamb is put on the door frame of the house. The lamb must be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. The lamb must be completely consumed and eaten in haste. Wow. The blood caused the Lord to pass over and prevented the destroyer from entering the house. But thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Yeah. First Corinthians five seven. Let's start at verse six. So Paul writing to the church in Corinth, there was immorality in the church. He says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? See, I was using that Passover language. Leaven is yeast and Spiritually, that represented sin that could corrupt the whole batch of dough, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Passover language. First Peter chapter one. <clears throat> I'm starting at seventeen. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. The blood of Jesus applied to our life delivers us from death. John chapter 5, Jesus talks about how those who believe in him have passed from death to life. Romans chapter 8, 1, where he talks about there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit and life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. And he talks about how what the law couldn't do, because it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending Christ, and the likeness of sinful flesh. To condemn sin in the flesh. To set us free. And so the Lord's Supper, isn't it amazing how the Lord's Supper was instituted during Passover? Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples before he got crucified. That transition from the old to the new. The Lord's Supper memorializes the sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God. See that in Matthew? Matthew. Then we see, next slide. 
Then we notice after they um, finish observing this Passover, um, and I just want to back up too. So the people cross over, cross over the river, they get circumcised, right? That, that wasn't like a, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of men getting circumcised and then they had to heal, right? So we know there was some time that, that passed um, with that. Um, then after that, they observed the Passover. We know that they had to keep the lamb at least four days um, after they got, so you know, some more time has passed, right? And um, it is an amazing how God had put the fear in the people because what a time to attack would have been as these guys were being healed up from being circumcised. But God had put the fear in their hearts so they were able to do what God wanted them to do without being messed with. Right? Amen. And thank God for the ladies who had to take care of all the men that was in pain <laughs> while they were healing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right. So then um, in Joshua 5, after they celebrate this Passover, the first Passover in the promised land at, at this place, Gilgal. Right, which means rolling away. God says he's rolled the reproach of Egypt off of the people. Gilgal is very significant. There's a lot of significant things that happen in the Old Testament at Gilgal. Um, it's one of those places where uh, God uh, did some things um, and then it, it, it became an amazing place. And so uh, just uh, quickly, so Gilgal is the place where they, they have this, uh, the people are circumcised and they observe the first Passover um, the last mention of Gilgal in the Old Testament is where Elijah was taken up from Gilgal. Mm. It's amazing. But a lot of significant events happened there. So you'll see that come up again throughout the Old Testament. Um, so we see that it says, um, <clears throat> Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Uh, so the manna, we saw that begin. Um, God began providing manna for the people as they were wandering through the wilderness. Um, and we see that here's a, another transition point where now God is transitioning them from eating the manna to eating the produce of Canaan. And see, something we have to remember is that God always intended for people to experience abundance and stability in their lives, right? That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. That was God's purpose for humanity. He gave us all things freely, right? He said, of every tree of the garden, you know, you may freely eat, go subdue the land, all this kind of stuff. He wasn't charging people for, you know, he just had blessed humanity, right? <laughs> Worship me, serve me, you have all of this to enjoy, right? Then sin came in the world, and we put a price tag on everything, right? And we hoard him, and we're just, <laughs> then we got Black Friday, right? <laughs> got to stand in line to get a deal. <laughs> Amen. Um, poverty and lack is a result of sin in the world. It's a result of sin. It wasn't, God never intended for anybody to be struggling and don't know where to, you know, that's, that's a result of sin in the world. But thank God that God will sustain his people in various ways, right? And so don't be alarmed when the method of provision changes, right? God is very, he, he's very capable of of taking care of you, whether it's a fixed income or a variable income or a <laughs> whatever, you know, he, he's great at it, right? Amen. All right, section three. Thank God for his provision. The process of submission, right? So we talked about the process of circumcision they had to go through, getting aligned with the covenant expectations, the process of Passover, they had to be reminded of where, how God delivered them um, to get them to this place where they are now. And now the process of submission. 
Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. The commander of the Lord's army, I am convinced, is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Called a Christophany. Joshua was reminded of who's in charge. The Israelites were under the Lord's command. It was his battle. It was his idea. The Lord God Almighty does not take sides. He executes judgment with no respect to person. We either choose the Lord's side or we choose to be against him. So don't get caught up in that. Well, God is on our side. This is the side where God is on. Or you have an idea and you want God to just go along with it. Or you do something and saying that, you know, God is going to bless it. God doesn't take sides. <laughs> God does not take sides. He's running the show. How many of y'all go to work and tell your boss what you're going to do today? Well, don't answer that because some of y'all might. But that don't work with the Lord. <laughs> Romans chapter 2. <laughs> he says, For there is no partiality with God. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Matthew twelve thirty. read from verse 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, well, I'm going to read from verse 24. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? They, therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. See how he draws a line in the sand? God doesn't take sides. You take his side. You should take his side. So what do we learn from this? The battle is the Lord's. It wasn't Joshua's army. He said, I come as commander of the Lord's, of the Lord's army. The battle is the Lord's. The army is the Lord's. The army is the Lord's to command. See, he had to put them in their place because sometimes, you know, we can kind of forget who's running the show. Yes. Yes. All right. 
The Israelites could not defeat the Canaanites without the help of the Lord. It was his plan and he was committed to bringing it to pass. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The commander in chief, like the song we listen to. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. As we bring in this home home. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Amen. See, our battle is a spiritual battle. Amen. Right? Ephesians 6.10 says, We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions. Our weapons are spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, he says, We war not... Though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our, war, of our war are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, the gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Matthew 24, 14. So get ready, church, to endure hardness as a good soldier. Right? Get ready, church to wage the good warfare. Get ready church to fight the good fight. What is the good warfare? Making disciples who also make disciples. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2 you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Yeah. See that disciple making discipleship yeah. in there? Yeah. This is the final order from the commander, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Make disciples. Mm -hmm. Right? Matthew 28, 19. Amen. Go make disciples of all the nations. In closing, our promised land is not found here on earth. Our promised land is the new heavens and the new earth. Believers will live in the new Jerusalem with God forever. Yeah. Revelations 21 through 22. Jesus said it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But you must be born again yes. to see the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yes, God loves you, but he's just not letting you in if you don't believe on Jesus. Sorry. You must be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the inheritance he has prepared for his people. Amen. Amen.